Here in Romans chapter 6, I want to focus on this last verse. If you'll notice in verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. Now, wages are something you earn. What we deserve for breaking God's law, it's not just the death of this body. There's something about you that will last forever. And I can't see it. It's your soul. It's your spirit. The wages of sin is death. And it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What I'd like to do this morning is uh, we're going to have, uh, I'd like the young men to come up and we're going to pass out. I want everybody to get a three by five card and I need a couple helpers. And then what I'm going to do, and there's pens as well. Now, the last time I used a marker board, I was told that my board was too little. (laughs) And they said it wasn't fair to ask the people on the front row if they could see or not and how their spectacles were. So I got a bigger board. And this was actually donated. It was 100% free. Praise the Lord for that. What I want you to do on your 3x5 card is write soul and circle it. And then I want you to delineate your card. I want to separate it. We're going to have a division. And I want to give you the four technical points on how to troubleshoot a soul. If you'll write this down on this card and take it with you, you're going to have some verses today. We're going to read them, but you'll learn them. You'll be able to memorize them. And then you'll be able to effectively evaluate whether or not somebody's actually saved. The Bible says that we can know for sure. Uh, The Bible is my first point, and I'll explain that. But we're using Romans 6.23. We're going to start with Romans 6.23. And I've asked for a volunteer. Thank you, ma'am. She has so graciously volunteered to write while I talk because I can barely chew gum and tie my shoes at the same time. So I'm thankful for all the help that we get. Uh, Romans 6.23 is indicating to us that if we got what we deserve, we would end up in hell. But God wants to give us a gift, and it's called eternal life, and it's everlasting life, and it will never cease, it will never stop. Most people, when you go to evaluate whether or not they're saved, the first point is Bible. Some people have an authority problem. They don't believe the Bible. Or they don't believe in God. Or they'll say they don't believe in heaven and hell. Now, everybody's a little different. The Bible is God's Word. It's His living Word. God has written us a love letter. B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving earth. If we'll read this before we leave earth, we'll do well when we get to heaven. That's the goal of it. But a lot of people have an authority problem with the Bible itself, and they don't believe in God, or they don't believe He exists. Now listen, when you're trying to get someone saved, it won't do you any good to argue science science and evolution. But let me tell you, there is an argument there. Science is just now catching up with what the Bible has already told us. God is true. However, you're going to run into certain skeptics that no matter what you say, you're not going to get anywhere. Brother Jake, in his presentation this morning, made the point that if somebody does not believe they're a sinner, how can you convince them that they need a Savior? And that's what this point is all about. Do you believe the Bible is God's authority? God has given us His Word. And so again, we don't want to get in an argument with somebody if you're out soul winning. Some people may express some doubt. However, whenever Scripture is read, they actually submit and become humble. This happened with Brother Larry and I just this past week where a guy comes, well, I don't know about the Bible. I said, do you believe the Bible is God's Word? And he says, well, I don't know. I mean, what about some of the contradictions? And he asked a question and I gave him an answer right out of the Bible. And as soon as I read the Bible to him and explained from the Bible God's Word, this is the authority. This is the only book that claims that God will come and live inside of you. This is the only book that claims to actually be written by God Himself This man's mind changed right away and he saw it as his authority. And so the Bible is the way to prove the Bible. And people oftentimes may say, well, I don't know if I believe in heaven or hell. But then as you begin to explain what the Bible says, death and hell and eternal judgment, many times people will humble themselves and admit and confess that they do believe the Bible and that they want to be saved. Uh, You have to believe that you're a sinner to to receive the Savior. Uh, Hebrews 11, 
if you would, uh, go to Hebrews 11. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few verses for you, and we're going to turn to some of these. But if you write them down, you can take it with you, and you will be able to effectively troubleshoot a soul. Just like a mechanic may put their hands on a motor, and they're going to test one thing over here and test another thing here, and they'll put their machine to evaluate this. And that's what I want you to do. Through using the Bible and the Holy Spirit inside of you, you will be able to evaluate... Uh, if somebody is actually saved or not. Okay, now Hebrews chapter 11, if you look at verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You understand what that's saying? When you come to God, you have to believe that God exists. You can't pray to God and say, I don't believe in God. There are people that may shake their fist at the sky and they're angry with their situation in life. And God sees their heart and God knows their thoughts and God created their eyes and their ears and their heart. He knows their mind. He knows their spirit, right? Well, when you come to God and you start searching for God, He knows your heart. And if you're coming to God, you say, Lord, I don't know where you are or who you are. And if this is you, you prove it to me. There's nothing wrong with a prayer like that. In fact, if you have a skeptic in your life and you say, let me challenge you to do this. Why don't you call on God and say, God, if you're real, prove yourself to me. The Bible says we should prove God. And if they're willing to say, if you're real, show yourself, they're coming to God believing that He exists. Notice the second half of this verse. It says, uh, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. When we come to God seeking for Him, He will reward you and help you find Him in salvation. These are not broken down as the four points of the Gospel, but these are elements that must be necessary for somebody to really be saved. You have to believe that the Bible is God's Word, that it's His authority. In fact, uh, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. In Psalm 53, it tells us, it says, the fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. It says it in more than one place it says that. that the fool will say, well, there is no God. There is no Creator. There is no Judge. But your soul, it's written in your soul, you know that there's a judgment coming. In Revelation 21.8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, and then it says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I'm here to tell you, you may say, well, I'm not too bad, or I'm not as bad as them, but the fact remains, you have broken God's law. He is holy. He's made you a promise of both heaven and hell, and you get to choose which one you want. It's up to you. And if you've lied, which we all have, then we've broken His law, and we deserve a punishment. Now, God is not willing that any should perish. God is compassionate and long-suffering. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. God wants people to be saved, but it is their choice. Now, if they hate the Bible and they begin to hate God because they watch too much TV, that will corrupt their heart and their perspective of their Creator. You're in First Pe Second Peter chapter 1, look at verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So he's saying the Word of God didn't come by the will of man. It wasn't some guy sat down and said, I'm going to write this out and I'll connect the dots out of all the authors we have in the Bible in all the different places written over all the different years. And that there's a pattern in here from the beginning to the end. And there's prophecy that's connected in such supernatural ways. Listen, this is a supernatural book. This is a heavenly book. What's inside here, if you sit down, it will blow your mind what God has written out, what He's laid out in His plan. And listen, God is the God of order. He has a plan from the beginning, from the end. There is no contradiction in the Bible. No, not one. Now, if you have one of these new Bible versions, well, there are contradictions. They've changed things, and they've omitted things, and they've literally deleted verses. There are contradictions in the NIV. Those are easy to find. You show me one in this one, and we'll talk. 
Now, look what he says. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but look what it says. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What he's saying is, prophets were preaching God's Word as God's Spirit fell upon them and His Spirit stirred them up and their words were the words of God. I believe that sometimes just by reading this verse and this passage to people, it can help them understand that the Bible is true. Instead of arguing with somebody that wants to be a skeptic, sometimes you just need to read what God said and let His Word do the work. Let His Spirit work in their spirit as a witness. If you would, go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. My last point on Bible is uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration is God breathing into His Word. It's His Spirit working. It's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. God's Word is for us. Every verse is important. And we should not have one of those Bibles that actually deletes verses. You're going to be missing out on something very, very important. My second point here is Jesus. How can I troubleshoot a soul? Well, first of all, do they believe God's Word? Do they believe that they deserve hell for breaking uh, His law? Do they understand that God's made a promise of heaven? If you can't get past this, well, there's no point in going on to the rest. This is where it begins. As he said, we must come to Him with faith, believing that He exists, believing that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. My next point is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I have to warn you, uh, the, the Bible actually tells us that there are those that preach another Jesus. They preach another gospel. The Mormons, for instance, they preach a completely different Jesus than what the Bible has. It's totally different. Their Jesus is the brother to Lucifer. He's one of many gods. And if you believe in Him now and do good works, you can go and have your own planet like Kolob, the planet that Jesus came from, and you uh, can have millions of virgins uh, that are, are yours to repopulate this new earth with. Bizarre stuff in the Mormons. They believe in three different levels of heaven. Joseph Smith was a seducer, uh, a seancer, and he was into sorcery and Satanism. He was a Freemason. He was part of a Satanic secret society. And he merged those Satanic doctrines with Bible doctrine and created a cult is what he did. So uh, you have to be clear. Some people may say the name of Jesus, but they actually believe in a completely different Jesus than we have in the Bible. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the essence of the Gospel. Uh, he says in verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Salvation is dependent upon your perspective of Jesus. Is He the Christ? Is He the Savior and the Messiah? We have to believe that Jesus is both God and Savior. That's the Jesus the Bible teaches. That's who we believe in. This is important. Uh, but He died for our sins so that we don't have to pay for Him in hell. And He didn't stay in the grave. No, no. He resurrected and now He's alive forevermore sitting in heaven until He comes back to pour out His wrath. We must believe that Jesus died for our sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. This is an essential part of troubleshooting someone's soul. As Brother Jake alluded to in the morning, I've had people, uh, I'll never, never forget it, out in Texas, this young Catholic girl, she was Hispanic, and she said she had never heard that Jesus had resurrected. Never heard it in her life. And she must have been 15, 16, 17 years old, raised in the Catholic church, and it just boggles my mind. And I know, listen, sometimes you go to church and you're a little sleepy and you know you just barely made it here and you're a little tired and distracted and you start thinking about lunch and what you want to do when you get home and oh no, we forgot to mow the lawn. And listen, forget about that for a second so you don't get distracted. Because what happens in these other churches, people are raised and I think that they miss out on a lot of the doctrine they teach, both good and bad, right? The Catholics teach some things that are correct, but they also teach some things that are totally incorrect 
especially about salvation by faith, okay? So I want you to focus this morning. My will is that God's Holy Spirit would fill you, the hearer, the listener, and that you would be benefited by learning these verses and writing them down. All right, keep writing on your cards. Um, let me give you a couple things. Go to John 10. If you would go to John 10, what I'm going to do is every other one, and I'll read the one in between. In, in John 5, Jesus said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but it also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. In James 5, or John 5, this is such a big deal. The Jesus that we believe in, when he said that God is my Father, the Jews wanted to stone him and kill him because when he said, I'm the Son of God, he was making himself equal with God. I want you to understand that Jesus is the Son of God, which makes him God. That's what the doctrine means, okay? You're in John 10, 36. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now blasphemy is when you say something against God. And the Jews said, well, you're blaspheming if you're claiming to be the Son of God, because they knew that that meant he was saying, I am God. If you would go to Philippians chapter 2. I don't have it in here this morning, but there are several places that teach that Jesus is the Creator. All things were made by Him, it tells us. He is our Creator. He is our Redeemer. He is our Savior. He will be our Judge in eternity. This is important. In Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. God came and dwelt with us. That name is Emmanuel. In fact, go to John 1. Go to John chapter 1. Jesus is the Son of God, which makes him God. I believe that somebody that doesn't see Jesus as God, they don't understand the Scriptures, who the Messiah was to be, or what it means to be the Son of God. Uh, I would say that if you have a problem with seeing Jesus as God, you have the wrong Jesus, and that may mean that you're not saved because of how you see Jesus. Now the Bible tells us that salvation, we have to have faith as a child. It does not tell us that we have to have adult-like doctrine and understanding to be saved. No, it tells us we have to have childlike faith in Jesus for salvation. And then He can give us doctrine later. So uh, it's important for us to understand that. And even a child, they, they walk over to a light switch and they flip it. They don't understand how electricity works, how the wiring works, how the power pole works, and the meter and the grid. They don't get that, but they have faith that it's going to come on. Even children in your house, they may go to the fridge and they open it and there's like, Snacks! They don't understand that daddy has to get up and go to work and put on his big boy britches and clock in or clock out or do a job or go to a business and deal with all these other things out in the world just to be able to get a little bit of cash, which now they want to turn it digital, right? And they want to put a chip in you, they're talking about. Our government's talking about that. So they want to give us this digital cash or they want to give us some form of a money so then we can go to the grocery store and then we can get some food and we bring it home and we put it in the refrigerator. The kids don't get all that. They, by faith, go to the... They just, hey, here's some food. Thank you, Daddy, He provided. Well, that's the kind of faith we have to have for salvation. But let's be very clear about the Jesus we're talking about. If you go to a Mormon and you talk to them and you listen to them for two minutes, you might walk away saying, well, I don't know. They said they believe Jesus saves and they believe the Bible and maybe they're the same as us. But if you talk to them for about 20 minutes, you'll find out real quick they're drastically different from a Bible-believing Christian, okay? Uh, so surface level, sometimes people will have an answer, but if we're really going to troubleshoot their soul, we have to go a little deeper, okay? Jesus, you're in John 1. Look at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Now, the Word is one of Jesus' many titles. There's over a dozen titles in John 1 for Jesus alone. The, the Lamb of God, the light that lighteth the whole world, the Christ, uh, the Messiah. All these names are in John chapter 1. Uh, I want you to connect these dots, though, because when it says He's the Word, He is the Son of God. And the Son of God is God. It tells us in chapter 1 that the Word was God. So, is Jesus God according to verse 1? Amen? Okay, now look at verse 14. Look what it says. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we have Jesus, the Word made flesh. When did God come down in the flesh? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, He was the Son of Man. He was 100% man. He was the Son of God. He was 100% God. He walked the earth. He was completely sinless. And that's why He was able to succeed in not sinning. And He was able to take our punishment because another sinner can't die for a sinner. It takes a perfect, spotless sacrifice. Only God could accomplish that, not another man. Uh, look at verse 34. John 1, verse 34. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. It's important for us to recognize the Jesus that we believe in. He is the Son of God. He is God. And He died for all of our sins. Not just some of them. Not the little ones, but the big ones also. This is the Jesus that we trust in. Now some people uh, need more information about the Trinity, for instance, and I, I'll often use 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It talks about uh, how God made us in His image in Genesis 1. And 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us we have a body, soul, and a spirit. So we see that picture in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll notice 1 John 5.7, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. There's only one God, but the three parts, if you will, or persons, if you will, of that Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Together they make one God. And the Son came down to earth. The Word came and He was made flesh. He is the Son of God. And when He told that to the Pharisees, they were ready to pick up stones and stone Him because He made Himself equal with God. But of course it says He thought it not robbery to be equal with God because He is our Creator. He is our God. He is our Redeemer. The last verse of the books of Corinthians, which is 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it tells us the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. So it actually has the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, all three signing off on that book. So understanding that Jesus is God and Savior is very important to troubleshooting a soul. Uh, so if you would, go to Ephesians chapter 2. So we begin with the Bible. Do they have an authority problem? Do they believe they deserve hell by breaking God's Word? Then we move on. Do you believe in the Jesus of the Bible or do you have another Jesus? A false Messiah. Are you really trusting in yourself? Or do you believe in a Jesus that didn't die for all of your sins? Because if you do, that's a big problem. You've, you've gotten the wrong Scriptures. You've gotten the wrong Jesus. The next part we're going to talk about is that it's a gift. Now listen, salvation is by faith alone. A gift is totally free. You cannot purchase salvation with good works. I often use an illustration. If I said, hey, I'm going to give you a gift. Let me give you my Bible. Just give me $2. Well, you would say, that's not a gift. That's a, a good deal. If I said, okay, let me give you my Bible. Don't give me any money, but I need you to mow my lawn. You would say, well, that is working for it. You cannot work for a gift. When somebody buys you a birthday present or a Christmas present, if they put the receipt in there and they say, now pay me back when you get a, you know, you get a chance, you're like, well, that's not a gift if I have to purchase it. That wouldn't make any sense. I'd say, I'd say keep your gift and I'll keep my 20 bucks, right? I want you to understand salvation is by faith alone. It is a gift. This is where most people go wrong. And it's important because it's not by works and I want you to understand that the faith is not the gift. Salvation is the gift. There's a, a, a doctrine out there. It comes from Catholicism. It's called Calvinism. I believe in the Gospel of Jesus Christ, not the Gospel of John Calvin. John Calvin taught uh, what is often called fatalism, that God forces you. 
You have no free will. There is no choice. And John Calvin taught that, uh, that the Holy Spirit moves inside of you and gives you the gift of faith and regenerates you. That way, when you hear the Gospel, you can believe. But that's wrong. That's backwards. The Bible says you have a choice. You have to choose Jesus. It's not automatic. You have to understand and believe. So in Ephesians chapter 2, Look at verse 8, it tells us, For by grace are ye saved through faith. I want everybody to say those three words with me. Saved through faith. All right, all right. The 10 o'clock crowd was a little stronger. All right, did you guys fall asleep on me? Let's try this again, all right? One more time. Saved through faith. Amen! We're saved by what we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're trusting in Him. I'm not trusting in myself. We're saved through faith. He says, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know what boasting is? You know what we call that? Bragging. Bragging. If I came to you and I say, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person and I take care of my family and I go to work and I preach the Gospel and I give money to the church and I clean the church and I help the poor and I don't sin anymore. I quit smoking and joking and drinking and cussing and I don't run around like them and I am a, on Friday night I'm not at the bar. I, 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 I. If I tell you all of that, am I preaching Jesus? Or am I preaching my works? I want you to understand, there are a lot of life change gospels out there. It's called Lordship Salvation. I had a guy call the church yesterday, and he says, uh, he started talking about many different things and ended up on this conversation. He said, Well, you know, the, the, the Ten Commandments, they're commandments, they're not suggestions, and we have to repent of our sins to be saved. And I said, Stop right there, buddy. Have you stopped sinning? Well, no. Okay, so if you're telling me I have to turn from all of my sin to be saved, then none of us can be saved. Repent means to change your mind. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say repent of your sins? Not once, not nowhere. Once you're saved, now we saw it earlier in Romans 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid! How, how shall we that are dead to sin continue therein? What's he saying? Once you're saved, the Holy Spirit moves in and he, want to help you. he wants to help you look like Jesus and live like Jesus, but you're not saved by your good works. You're not saved by turning from sin. It's not by turning over a leaf and becoming a new person. No, no, no. Salvation is by faith alone. And this is why there are many that have good works and they think they can do it without Jesus. They'll end up in hell. Or worse than that is the, the Christian that needs to get saved. Let me give you an illustration. I'm holding this Bible just with my right hand. That's a true statement, isn't it? Yeah. I'm only trusting in Jesus and Him alone. A and I have to be a good person. Now think about it. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm only holding it with my right hand. Is it still true it's only my right hand? Of course not. Now my left hand's getting involved. What happens is, the Gospel is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then many other people, they say, well, and I should turn from all my sin because I'm a pretty good person. And you know what? I'm better than my neighbor. And you know what happens is, they take all the glory from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus plus anything equals nothing because your works are as filthy rags. And no sooner than you can really pat yourself on the back and say, I did it, well then... You mess up the sin of the mind, sins of omission, the thought of foolishness is sin. If you lay around dreaming about winning the lottery instead of going to work, that's a sin. The covetousness, lusting, those are sins of the mind. We're all found guilty, but we're saved by faith in Jesus because He's given us His grace and His mercy. Acts 16.31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, that means anybody, believeth in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you would, go to Romans 4. Go to Romans 4. Let's take a look. Let's see here. Excellent work. Thank you. I appreciate your help. 
It's not by works. It's a gift. What must I do to be saved? Believe, it says. Whosoever believeth, it says. We're going to go to Romans 4 because sometimes we get a question. In fact, out soul winning yesterday, we talked to a gentleman for a little while. And then uh, we go on down the road. We're talking to a few other people. And as we're leaving with somebody else, he goes, hey, hey, come here, come here. So my family and I, we go back and we talk to him for a minute. And he says, what about the people in the Old Testament? How were they saved? I want you to understand there are many man-made systems of theology that take away from the simplicity of the Gospel. I want you to understand that Adam and Eve and Seth, the first man that died, they were all saved by faith in the promise that God would send His Son as a sacrifice. Enos, it tells us in Genesis 4, and then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. You're not saved by a prayer. You're saved by who you're praying to. <laughs> you're saved by uh, believing that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. In Romans chapter 4, look at verse 3. It says, For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Do you know what that means? Abram was saved by faith not because he was a good person. Not because he had a lot of money. Not because he employed people. Not because he preached the Gospel. He was saved by what he believed. It says, look at verse 3, it was counted unto him for righteousness. There's going to be an accounting. One day we're going to stand before the great accountant and he's going to look at your record. But listen, if, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Without faith, you can't be saved. Look at verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. What's he saying? If you come and mow my grass, I owe you a debt. I have to pay you the money. I can't work for salvation. Otherwise, God would owe it to us. And that's not how it works. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're trusting Him alone for salvation, it's counted as righteousness. There are none righteous. No, not one. I'm not perfect and neither are you. I don't always do the right thing, but when I put my trust in the One who is, He gives me the gift of perfection, if you will. He gives me the gift of forgiveness of sins. Verse 6, He tells us about David. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, Unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Boy, underline that in your Bible if you do that. Without works. Do you know that without doing the good works, your soul can go to heaven because you trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? What a blessing. The next verse in verse 7, he says, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. David says, Praise the Lord, my sins have been forgiven. Go to Acts 10. I want you to see that and we'll finish in this section. Acts chapter 10. When you get there, we'll look at verse 43. To Him give all the prophets witness. That means all the Old Testament prophets preach this one thing. To Him give all the prophets witness that through His name, whosoever believeth in Him shall receive remission of sins. Your sins have been paid because of Jesus Christ. And they looked forward to Him coming. We look back to the fact that He did. Without Him, we would still be in our sins. Now, if you would go to John 10. We're going to finish up here. We're almost done. Stay with me. This is very important. My final point is life. And when I say life, that means it's for life. And your soul will live forever. Your spirit will live forever. So I'm talking about everlasting life. I'm talking about eternal life. Some people think they can lose their salvation. I had a guy one time, and uh, he came to the church, and he started bragging of his works. Just telling, I used to be in this filthy lifestyle, and... He gave details like, okay, don't talk about that in church, you know? And he kept talking about, I used to be that way and I'm not anymore. And I have Psalm 119 memorized. This guy said that. Now, who's read Psalm 119? I don't want to put anybody to shame. You've read it. Elijah. Is that a long one or a short one? Long one. A long one. Is it the longest one in the whole Bible? Yeah. This guy came to church and he was a big old muscly dude. He was bragging. He was a weightlifter and I got all these awards and. I quit living this wicked lifestyle and I memorized the biggest chapter in the Bible. And when asked, 
but what if you went back to that lifestyle would you still go to heaven he said well if i do i was never saved you know what he was doing is putting his confidence in his works and he was boasting of his works he didn't have everlasting life no no he had temporary life in his mind because he could lose it if he stumbled and went back to that sin listen when god does something he does it forever in john 10 28 look what it says and i give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand when you're in god's hand well in hebrews uh, uh, 13 it says i will never leave thee nor forsake thee when you're in god's hand he won't let you go you didn't save yourself by being good and you can't keep your salvation by being good it's a gift it's from god he did the hard work and he will never let you go it is called eternal life and if they don't have eternal life they're probably not saved when and this is so serious this is so important when you ask somebody are you sure you say yeah 100 percent well 99.9 Ooh, so you're 0.1% sure you're going to hell? Well, if I go back to all that other stuff I used to do, I might end up in hell. Listen to me, they are not saved. They don't have eternal life. They're not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're trusting in their works and their lifestyle and their walk with God. They're trusting in their head knowledge. They're trusting in wherever they're at at that moment. Listen, Christian. We have nothing to brag of. We have nothing that we can boast of that we've accomplished. All I did was take the gift. He paid for it. And He promised it's forever. Go to the next chapter. Go to John chapter 11. While you're going there, let me read Titus 1-2. It says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God promised you it's forever forever. And he does not lie. That's good news. You're in John 11. Look at verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You understand the statement Jesus is saying, if you're alive on the earth, you still have a chance. And I'm telling you right now, if you believe in me, you will never die. If you believe in me for eternal salvation, your soul will not go to hell. Do you believe that? And I put that question to you today. If in your mind you say, yeah, but you don't know where I've been or what I've done. God does, and He paid for that sin already. If you say, well, I know about Jesus, but I'm just not ready yet. You're choosing hell. We spake of brother, uh, brother Frank this morning. We prayed for him. He goes up the road right over here. He gets T-boned by a stranger. And apparently it was a hit and run. They disappeared. They had to do CPR on the spot. I, I don't know brother Frank. I'm told he's saved. If he wasn't trusting in Jesus and he was thinking, I'll get around to it one day, it might be too late. This is a now issue. This is a do it today thing. Today is the day of salvation. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're uncertain in any way, you don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to bow at these steps. You don't have to get in front of everybody. In your heart, out of humility, you say, you know what, Lord? I haven't been trusting in You. I see I've been trusting in me, and I need Your help. Would You help me to believe in You? Because I believe that I deserve hell. And I believe that You died for all my sin. And I just want to take the gift of God, which is eternal life, and by taking it now, I know that my soul is sealed unto the day of redemption. I know that I have nothing to fear. If you're on the line, I encourage you, take that step of faith. All you have to do is believe. And it lasts forever. The problem is, people get puffed up and they don't think it's that easy. Well, but I've done a lot of stuff. It doesn't matter. In Hebrews 10, at the end of it, it says that we are sanctified. It says, through Jesus Christ, once for all. Once for all. Jesus died once. You take the gift 
once and it is finished. In 1 Peter 1, let me read this verse 4, it says, "...to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you." I ask you, is your inheritance reserved in heaven? Don't tell me about your uh, 501 or 401k here. Don't tell me about your inheritance here. Well, I'm going to leave 10 acres to the kids. Okay, well, what about up there? What are you going to get when you pass, when your soul departs from your body? Are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you understand that He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. And if you have faith as a child, if you're willing to humble yourself and say, you know what? I believe that. That sounds good. That's a whole lot easier than me trying to work my way there and have a lifelong endeavor of being perfect. No one can be perfect. Don't be deceived by the false gospel. I want you to use this information to be able to troubleshoot a soul. Starting with your own. If there's any of these points that you feel that you're weak on, get it sorted out today. Come and talk to me. Salvation is by faith alone. It's called once saved, always saved. He made a promise and He doesn't lie. In our Sunday school hour, Brother Jake brought up his most famous verse, and I'll end with this. In John 5.24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth My Word, that's what you're doing right now, and believeth on Him that sent Me, that's Jesus Christ, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You're on your way, your way to death and hell, the second death, and if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that He paid for your sin, you're passed from death unto life. You've taken the gift and you're eternally saved. This is the Gospel. The Gospel means good news. It's simple. It's easy. I give you these four, four points to try to evaluate. I just want to help you understand that you have eternal life right now by believing in Jesus. That's His promise. If you haven't taken the gift, won't you do it now? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for Your promises. Lord, thank You for dying for a wretched sinner like me. Lord, You know the thoughts of everyone in here. Lord, You know our hearts. And You know our destination. And Lord, if there are those that are not saved, that have not trusted You, I pray that You would give them the burden of solving it now before they lay their head down on another pillow. Lord, we think of Brother Frank. Lord, I trust that he's saved from what I hear. But Lord, it's too late for him to work for you right now as he's laying in a hospital bed. Lord, I pray that you would spare his life and raise him up. But Lord, help us to realize that we never know when something can change in our health or our life. Lord, it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. I just ask that you would help us to completely trust in You and not our own selves. Lord, I pray that You would help us as we have a time of fellowship today. And Lord, we're going to go eat some salad here that You provided for and some meat. And Lord, I just ask Your blessing on that food. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.